Hi everybody, my name is Mr Barlow and welcome to episode 15 of the VC Biology Podcast. In this episode I'll be talking about hormones and the endocrine system as well as neurons and the nervous system in animals. So animals coordinate the activities of their cells and respond to the environment by using both their nervous and their endocrine or hormonal systems. So the responses of both of these systems often occur to achieve something that's called homeostasis. So homeostasis is basically a stable internal environment. So in fact there are heaps of things in the human body that are maintained at stable levels or are under homeostatic control. Um, For example, the temperature of the human body is maintained at a stable level and it's normally around 37 degrees. Um, The level of nutrients in the blood, so the amount of glucose in the blood is under homeostatic control. The concentration of ions in the body, the amount of water in the body, um, all of these things are under homeostatic control. So they're kept at really constant levels and that's homeostasis. Now to achieve homeostasis, a special type of stimulus response model called a negative feedback system is used. So a negative feedback system is a system where the response or an organism's response is something which reduces the effect of the original stimulus. So like all stimulus response models, a negative feedback system basically involves a stimulus, a receptor, a control center, an effector, and a response. So I'll give you an example of a negative feedback system uh, involving temperature, which is something that's maintained at homeostatic levels. So let's say I went outside on a really hot day and I was wearing a really big warm coat. My body would basically start to get warm, so it would start to get too hot. So the stimulus in this example would be, you know, heat, I would start to get too hot but a receptor would have to pick that up. So I've got receptors in my skin, in fact, uh, which detect when you get too hot or too cold. So a receptor on the skin would pick up that I was too hot. It would send a message to the control center and the control center for temperature regulation is actually the hypothalamus in the brain. The hypothalamus would then send another message to an effector, and this is something which kind of gets the job done. So it might send a message to maybe my arm muscles and my arm muscles would initiate a response. And this response might be, take the big warm jacket off. And then of course I would get cooler. So the stimulus in this example was, I was too hot. I went through a receptor, control center, effector, and the response was take the jacket off to cool down. So this is an example of a negative feedback system because the response cooling down is opposite or it decreases the effects of the original stimulus, which was heating up. So that was in fact an example of a negative feedback system in the nervous system. But in reality, both the nervous system and the endocrine system engage in these negative feedback systems to maintain homeostasis in the body. Now to go into a bit more detail about the endocrine system, the endocrine system is basically a collection of small organs or endocrine glands that release hormones into the body. So hormones are produced in one part of an organism, so in one of the endocrine glands, and then they travel in the internal transport system, or the blood, to transmit their signal to target cells. Now these target cells are actually highly specific and only have receptors on their surface which respond to a very specific hormone. So yeah, hormones are are really highly specific. They're only released when there's a particular stimulus and they only target these very specific cells. So because hormones, the messengers of the endocrine system, are released in and travel in the bloodstream, when you compare the speed of you know, the transport of messages between the endocrine system and the nervous system, you find that the nervous system is able to transmit messages much more quickly. Um, that's basically because it sends electrical messages in special cells called neurons around the body. But we'll talk about that a bit later. Now to talk a little bit more about hormones, there's actually two main types of hormones. There's fat-based hormones, and these are synthesized from fatty acids, and these hormones are small and lipid-soluble. So because they're lipid-soluble, they can easily pass through the plasma membrane of cells. 
The other type of hormone is a protein-based hormone. So these are made up of amino acids. They're not water soluble and they also can't pass through the plasma membrane of cells. So when it comes to transmitting a mess hormone transmitting a message into a cell, a lipid soluble hormone can dissolve through the membrane, go straight into the cell and transmit its message in within the cell itself. But a protein based hormone must attach to a receptor on the surface of the cell and that receptor, prote receptor protein on the surface of the cell will then send the message into the cell. So that's the two different types of hormones. There's lipid-based hormones and there's protein-based hormones. So hormones, as I mentioned previously, are released from endocrine glands and there's actually a whole bunch of endocrine glands in the body. There's the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland in the brain. There's the adrenal gland that releases adrenaline. There's the testes in males. There's the ovaries in females. There's the thyroid gland. And in fact, many other organs that are part of other body systems like the kidney, liver, and the heart also have uh, secondary endocrine functions. So the endocrine system releases literally hundreds of different types of hormones. For example, uh, the adrenal gland uh, releases adrenaline and that's basically responsible for preparing the body for action in a fight or flight uh, situation. Prolactin is a different hormone released by the pituitary gland and this stimulates uh, milk secretion from the breast in breastfeeding mothers. Uh, the ovaries release estrogen and this promotes uh, the menstruation cycle as well as the development of uh, female features. Testosterone is the other one released by the testes, and this um, basically promotes the development of masculine features. Uh, the pancreas releases both insulin and glucagon, and these are both uh, involved in the homeostatic control of blood glucose. So insulin, for example, lowers blood glucose. So if your body detects that there's too much blood glucose in the body, it'll release insulin, uh, and that'll reduce the level of blood glucose. So that's you know the way blood glucose is under negative feedback or homeostatic control. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of different hormones out there. So I've talked all about the endocrine system and the other control system in animals is the nervous system. So the nervous system is composed of millions of special cells called neurons. So these special cells send electrical messengers around the body. And in fact, all neurons have the same general structure. So basically the dendrites in a neuron collect the message and then an electrical impulse is passed along the axon of a neuron. The axon is insulated by myelin sheath. So myelin sheath is made up of special Schwann cells and uh, so it insulates it which means it basically stops the message from escaping. At the end of the axon the message is passed on from axon terminals. So when the message or the impulse arrives at axon terminals it triggers the release of these vesicles and these vesicles contain these very special molecules called neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters cross the space between two different neurons and then they bind to very specific receptors on the next neuron and that basically enables the message to continue from one neuron to the next. So the little gap that neurotransmitters cross from one neuron to the next is actually called a synapse. Now because the nervous system works very fast, it's used for very special responses called reflex responses. Now reflexes are very quick, unconscious and automatic responses to stimuli. So for example, if I poke my finger with this really sharp pin I'm holding, it should initiate a reflex response. Let's try it out. Ready? <sighs> ah! Oh! Ow! Oh, that really hurt. I've lost my concentration. Ow! So, oh, all reflexes actually involve three special types of neurons. There's a sensory neuron, and that receives the information, receives the information from the stimulus. The information is then passed onto an interneuron, which resides in the uh, central nervous system. And then straight away, that message is passed from the interneuron to a motor neuron, uh, which basically uh, stimulates a response from a muscle. So when I just poked myself with a pin, what happened was the pin gave me a stimulus of pain. 
So then a sensory neuron in my skin, in this case a pain receptor, picked up that stimulus of pain and sent a message to the central nervous system to an interneuron. That interneuron basically immediately said, whoa, that's a big stimulus of pain. We better do something about that straight away. And it sent a message to a motor neuron. The motor neuron sent, a mes sent the message to a muscle and the message was basically, move your hand away from that stimulus so you don't get hurt even more. So these, those three neurons, the sensory neuron, interneuron, and motor neuron, working together, create this reflex arc, and that basically explains how reflexes happen. Now the entire nervous system can actually be broken up into two main parts. The central nervous system, which is composed of the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which basically encompasses all of the rest of the neurons in the body. Now with respect to the brain, different regions of the brain actually uh, control different functions. So for example, the hypothalamus, um, you know, kind of controls homeostasis. The cerebellum is involved in the coordination of muscular activity, including, you know, balance and movement. The brain stem uh, is associated with the control of the heart and uh, blood vessels and lung ventilation. And the cerebrum, which is kind of the biggest part of the brain, um, is involved in complex thought. Now the peripheral nervous system can also be broken down into two main parts. And those two parts are the somatic and the autonomic nervous systems. So the somatic nervous system is the part of the nervous system which is all of your voluntary responses. So if you decide to throw a ball or pick up a pencil or jump or move your hand, then that's controlled by the somatic nervous system. And all of the things which you don't control, for example, um, your muscles doing peristalsis when you digest food or your heart beating, things like that, they're all controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So that's involuntary responses. Now the special receptors found in our major sense organs also uh, belong to the nervous system. So by senses I'm talking about sight, sound, taste, touch and smell. So for example in the sight system the eyes have got special receptors called photoreceptors in them and they collect light information. Another example is hearing. To hear things, you've got mechanoreceptors in your ears and these detect sound waves or you know, movement, which you know, sound waves are a type of movement. Taste and smelling things, we've got chemoreceptors in our nose and on our tongue. And these detect different chemicals in the air that you smell and in the food that you eat. And in terms of touch, you've got a whole bunch of neurons in your skin which can detect heat and cold and touch and pain and uh, all sorts of things. So they're the special sensory receptors which help us know basically what's going on in the environment around us. And that brings episode 15 of the VCE Biology Podcast to a close. I'm Mr. Barlow, and thank you for listening.